All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Conversation for Friday, February 25th, 2022. It's the last Friday of the month, and that means something special here on Context and Clarity. We'll jump into that in just a minute. If you've just joined us, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. If we've never met before, my name's Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis today, and I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar and you've said 2022 is my year and you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 29 years, and you're starting to rethink or even reimagine what that firm could or probably should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they're all the need to know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining me today. You'll notice the screen looks a little bit different today. And that is because it's the last Friday of February. And as we started last month in January, we launched the Context and Clarity Book Club. And every last Friday of the month is our book club discussion. So I'm joined by a whole handful of guests here today. We're going to get into uh, who these people are and what we're talking about here in a few minutes. But uh, welcome to the Context and Clarity Book Club today. Uh, let's see, looking around the room, I see it looks like uh, Mark LePage from 70 Degree Warm in North Carolina has joined us. He's the first in and the winner of today's John Kinney Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award for being first in. Yoko's joining us from Alexandria. Hans is uh, <laughs> joining us uh, from the metaverse and real life, virtually speaking, <laughs> from Portland, Maine. Scott Thrift is uh, up on the housetop, I think. Click, click, click. Um, on the roof, North Bend, Oregon cleaning Douglas fir needles out of the valleys and gutters. Um, that sounds dangerous. Context and clarity ing while yeah, and walking the and roof. Texting. Yeah, it's not safe. And, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's there ought to be a law against that. Well, welcome, Scott. Be careful, please. <laughs> Scott says, uh, you look at it, it looks like you got uh the people to join you. Yep, we got a whole whole motley crew here to join us today. Great having everybody. Scott says he's sitting in his driveway with his uh, with his dock at his side on a beautiful sunny afternoon in Portland, Oregon. Well, good for you. Enjoy that. Barry, welcome back. Good evening from Scotland. Glad you're joining us. Manuel, welcome from uh, New York City. He's here so far, he says. He wants to know, is there a way to get on the Zoom too? Well, we're not doing this through Zoom. We're doing it uh, through Restream like we do every Thursday. Uh, but um, since you asked that, every month we're looking for people that commit to read the book, first of all, and then want to be on screen with us in this format. So looking towards the end of March, and we will tell you at the end of this conversation today what the book for March will be. So you get a little head start, a few day head start. Uh, so um, if you are interested in being on screen like this in March, you need to let us know that. Of course, I'll ask that Monday as well. Who wants to join us on screen the same way Wendy and Ezra and Hans and Jay have today? Um, so we'll get into that later. Christian, welcome back from Ithaca, New York. And um, Scott says his dog is at his side. That makes more sense to me than his doc is at his side. So thanks for the clarification. I, I didn't know what was going on there. Uh, John Jones, welcome back from Westport, Connecticut, right across the street from Starbucks. Glad you're joining us today as well. And anybody else that's out there, say hi when you get here. And um, and also let us know where you are. Uh, as always, not as always, well, yes, as always for the, the book club and for Context and Clarity Live, we're simulcast right now to YouTube, to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to Twitter, and to Twitch. Uh, I'm sure most of you are joining us from Twitch right now. Today, we are streaming for the first time into the Entree Architect Ally, Architects and Allies group. So to all of the allies, the architects and allies out there, hello, welcome to the book club conversation. We want to expand these conversations um, and get as many people involved as we can and encourage as many people as we can to read these books that we're talking about. Uh, I've mentioned before that I set a goal in 2019 to read one book a month. The reason I did that is because I hadn't read anything in a long time. 
I don't even remember what the little symbols mean anymore. So I listen to books. Audible is my friend. Um, but uh, that was the best goal I ever set and ever sort of blew out of the water. I think I finished that year with close to 30. And um, I know many of us need to learn more and need to have a growth mindset. So the challenge this year is if if you want to read more books, if you just participate in the Context and Clarity Book Club, and all that means is we name a book at the beginning of the month, you read it throughout the month, and join us the last Friday of the month for this conversation. If you do that with us all year, you'll read or listen to 12 books this year. And I'm pretty sure it will change your business and change your life. We're two months in right now. Last month, we read uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. This month, the book that we're just about to discuss is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, This is one that I think everybody should read. If you haven't read this, just drop whatever you're doing. Open Audible, open the book, whatever, read it before the end of the weekend, because it will it will change the way you think about communicating. It'll change the way you relate to people. It'll change the way you negotiate. Uh, you know, raise your hand out there if you think you are um, a good negotiator uh, or if you're comfortable negotiating. I'm fairly confident that not a lot of hands went up. Um, I think that's a a point that many of us feel is a weak point for us. So uh, read this book. I think this is a really, number one, I think it's entertaining, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, I think it's an entertaining book, but I think it's an important book in terms of communicating. So that is, uh, that's what we'll, uh, that's what we'll discuss here right now. So again, if you're uh, just joining us, say hi, glad to have you here. Um, Let us know that you're here, even if you're just listening in or multitasking and let us know where you're joining from. Uh, If you're over on Facebook, and you're commenting right now, you're typing into the comment section, but your comments are not showing up on the screen next to us, then go take the URL it's, that's at the uh, bottom left of the corner right now, chat.restream.io slash FB, like Facebook, and type that into your browser. A couple of clicks later, you'll give Facebook permission to talk to Restream, and, um, and your comments should start showing up. The reason that that's happening to you right now is because you're joining from a closed Facebook group and because of privacy policy, Facebook can't communicate with Restream unless you give it specific permission. So chat.restream.io slash FB in your browser window will get you to the place you need to be. And uh, I think it is two clicks later, you'll give permission and your comments will start showing up. But for everybody that's on LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitter and all of our friends on Twitch, the hundreds and hundreds of followers on Twitch, welcome to the Context and Clarity Book Club. All right. So like I said, I'm Jeff. You know my co-host, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jeff. Catherine's joining us from Massachusetts today. Just multitasking from Massachusetts. <laughs> As people from Massachusetts do. So. It's, mu- it's multi-mass yep. tasking. Mm, okay. I'm not really though. I was just, you okay. said we could, but I know you didn't mean me. <laughs> well, if, if anybody sees Catherine over there writing, you know what she's doing mm. or sketching, you know what, painting hey, maybe. All five of us besides you, well, I'm not playing the fiddle. All five of us are from the Northeast. We've really yeah. cornered See, the, um, this is, this is like the uh, backstage last night. I feel like an outsider. I'm in the Midwest. Everybody else is in the Northeast. Um, let me introduce who we have. Uh, Isra's looking around there. That's Isra Banks. She's in uh, Boston. She's the founder of Trivec Architects. To her right on your screen and my screen is Wendy Brown. She's the founder of Wendy Brown Architects. Wendy, you're in Massachusetts as well. Where in Massachusetts are you? I am. I'm in Western Mass, almost to the New York border. All right. Yeah. So Western Mass. I guess we like to read books in the Northeast. I don't know. <laughs> That's what we all ended up so stereo <laughs> stereotypical behavior for us. This is the Northeastern Readers Club today. <laughs> I'm I'm the guest from the Midwest. Uh, let's see. Bottom left on your screen is Hans Bro. He's the founder and co-owner and principal architect at Project Co-op in Portland, Maine. And the bottom left-hand corner of your screen is Jay Carolla. He's the principal architect at Great Blue Heron Studio Architects. So welcome to all of you 
Thanks for joining us for the book club today. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this, uh, this caption off here. So our screen gets bigger. But again, if you're on Facebook and you are commenting, but your comments aren't showing up on the screen next to us, go to chat.restream.io slash FB. It's in the bottom left of your screen for the next three seconds before I hide it. Chat.restream.io slash FB. And that'll solve all the problems of your world. All of no them. guarantees. All of them. <laughs> all right. There it goes. So, um, yeah. So thanks. Great to have all of you uh, here on the screen, here in the uh, in the studio with us, so to speak. And then for those of you out there in the audience, also thanks for joining us. Again, today we're talking about Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, if you have questions and comments and you're in the, the studio audience, then uh, please go ahead and comment. And we'll try to bring as many of your comments into the conversation as you as we can. And of course, we'll have this uh, live conversation here on screen. First question, I guess, to ask, uh, and, and again, I'm a I'm, I'm a big proponent of this book. I love this book, but um, for all of you that may or may not feel that way, what um, what was your favorite part of, or maybe biggest takeaway from Never Split the Difference by Chris Foss? Well, I, I know for me, one of the biggest things was that one of the biggest outcome I have out of negotiating or a successful negotiation is a relationship affirming outcome. Um, and that's actually one of the goals of negotiation, not just sort of getting sort of a quantitative what you get really everyone walking feeling happy. Like they um, are fully admitted to the outcome and see you in light going forward too. Yeah, I, I was, um, again, this, if you haven't read the book, so Chris Voss, the author, is the former head hostage negotiator for the FBI. And so to me, it's super interesting to hear all these FBI type stories, which hopefully none of us are ever involved in. But then for him to relate it back to, you know, buying a car or negotiating for a salary, or, you know, things that we can identify with. And, you know, to your point, Hans, I, I also enjoyed the learning about the evolution of, I don't know, you can call that negotiating theory, um, you know, over the course of a lot of years. And what you were just describing was not the goal, right? Early, early in specifically hostage negotiations. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, I, th I think that is a great takeaway that it's, it's not just about getting what we want. Anybody my, else? My big takeaway is that really it's about uh, deep listening mm. to other people. So some people were commenting on how it's fake and what if the other person's fake and knows the same technique. But really, if you're just deeply listening to each other and trying to understand where each other is coming from and what you really want and what your worldview is, then it just makes for a better relationship, like Han said. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, my, uh, Mark says he's working hard to be empathetically tactical today. I think tactical empathy is the, the term that he uses in the book. And, um, it, it, when he was talking about that active listening and how hard that actually is, right? We have to actually have to put effort into listening to other people and understanding other people. That's one reason I think this book is so important is that it's not, it's not just about negotiating, but it's about listening to each other and communicating with each other. Um, and yeah, both parties have to participate, certainly. I don't know if I have a specific takeaway, but I, I did, I was able to, I changed my mindset in a way while well, midway through the book, I guess, was at first I was thinking this is like, treat, they're tricking somebody or they're, you know, and then he started to get into the techniques more and, and that made a little more sense. Um, also, I came away thinking like, what exactly do I need to negotiate? I certainly don't need to negotiate hostages. Um, but of course, 
now I now I can keep my eye out for for those situations. So for hostage situations. <laughs> well, no, hopefully. Yeah, not you're ready that. for that, Wendy. Yeah, maybe not quite that extreme, but. So, Wendy, I was I was gonna I was gonna say a similar make a similar point. I think that I don't I don't think I negotiate with my clients. It's it doesn't feel like a negotiation. Maybe, um, yeah, I but but I do own a couple properties and I'm interested in buying more properties. And so, um, you know, these tactics are hopefully going to come in handy, um, moving forward. And then this, the, maybe even a bigger takeaway is because it's winter break up here in the Northeast. Um, my kids are home from school and trying to be empathetically tactical with my kids is uh, there's a lot of negotiations that go on day to day. Um, so that's, that's my big takeaway is, is how to negotiate with my kids. Yeah. I, in terms of children, nego negotiating with children, I often think of it as, as you know, when the dishwasher's down and you walk into it by mistake and it really hurts your shin, you know what I mean? It's frustrating and hurts. That's the way I feel like it is if I'm just clashing with my kids because nobody's getting anywhere and it's just angry and it's that's the way I feel about it. Anyway, so but if I try to understand where they're coming from, like it sounds like you feel like you don't have enough freedom. And she's like, yeah, I never get to do what I want. Well, what do you think is fair? What's a fair time for you to come home? You know, so if I work on it like that, then we can work together on the issue she's having rather than me saying I want you to come home and I don't want to come home. That goes nowhere. Yeah. For example, I think that's a really good point, Cap. And, and it talks, it talks about that a lot is the whole working together on a solution. Um, you know, Chris Voss out when you're negotiating with someone, the counterpart, you sort of want them to, you want to clarify what you need and have them help solve what you want and what you need to get out of the situation too. And vice versa, it's really data mining. What do they really need? And which they might not even be clear about. In negotiation so it is this sort of interesting working together to figure things out which is you know i think puts everyone in a really great mindset a more empathetic mindset rather than sort of a zero sum I, i'm going to get as much as i can this and you've got to lose somehow um situation which i hate right, exactly books like that so, yeah. yeah that's that's one of my favorites and Maybe this is like pulling the curtain back. I don't know if any of you have, have gotten emails from me like this or, or had conversations, but one of my favorite parts is where he's essentially talking about let the other person, and Blair Inns, by the way, talks about this as well in, in Win Without Pitching Manifesto, but the idea of letting or forcing the other people to talk as much as possible and thereby getting them to talk themselves into the solution that you're after, I guess you're working on this together. But, but so if, if you've ever sent me an email, that's really long or start having a conversation, that's really where you talk a lot. And then my response is one sentence <laughs> long. I'm, I'm channeling Chris Voss, you know, and I, I, I like that because it, number one, it helps me understand or gets me closer to understanding what it is that you really want, because I don't think many of us are programmed to just come out and say, Hey, this is, this is exactly what I want. Um, I was actually doing this yesterday. You know, somebody said, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I just, a just a one question, one sentence response that spurs them to talk more about what it is they're trying to achieve, you know, give me something to actually respond to. And I, I look at it from a couple of points of view. Number one, um, you haven't given me enough to really respond to. You haven't really given me enough to, uh, to give good advice on, right? This wasn't necessarily a negotiation yesterday. Um, and I don't want to waste my time going down some road. That's not where you wanted to go anyway. So I, I really appreciate from a communication standpoint, that idea of getting them to talk and, you know, from the negotiation side, getting them to talk, talk themselves into, uh, into a direction that, that is closer to a solution. 
Manuel says he's uh, the empathetically tactical with his kids. He's going to need to read the book many more times to do that. In our house, we used to say we don't negotiate with terrorists. (laughs) It actually really does work, though, if you try to, because you're just trying to get to what what is their issue that they are reacting, you know, strongly to. So if you can kind of like hear them in that way, it really does help. Yeah, there was this yeah, that's important, I feel like important to have a long-lasting agreement, right? I mean, you can't just come to, like, the, the fake yes that he talks about in the book, right? right. And you have to go through that process to get to a, a real yes. Yeah, there's, there's commitment. Right? I feel like the silence, yeah. you know, just waiting for the other person to, to be able to let them, give them the time to say more is, is pretty valuable. And also, um, it can work to kind of diffuse a situation too. I, I was recommending to a relative who was getting in a conflict type situation for a few days. And I, I know this person and they, they just want to be right. And they just want to talk and talk. And talk. I said, you don't always have to respond, you know, because what was happening was, of course, it was just extending the disagreement, but um, silence can be, uh, you know, very helpful sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. It, and, you know, I, I think for a lot of us, it's really difficult, right? And I think it's, I think it's actually in the Blair Inns book where he talks about embracing the silence, basically asking the question and then being comfortable with a long, prolonged, you know, a prolonged silence until the other person ha- feels like they have to fill the void um, and us not even though it may be uncomfortable, us not filling the void, uh, that's probably something that some of us need to to work on because I, I think that's hard. You know, I think a lot of us want to fill that void. Is right? I think you were going to say was, something. Yeah, I was kind of intrigued by uh, the idea that he he insists on debunking uh, the idea of win win negotiation. Um, I, I, I kept trying to learn more and more, but I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I understand it. I don't know how it works. Like what's wrong with, I think he's saying that it's reason, but you have to focus more on emotions and I'm, I'm still like, I, I kind of liked the win-win situation. Do you mean... The win-win situation in terms of, well, I guess going to the title, like splitting, you know, meeting in the middle. Yes. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. I think we, we find out a way that, yeah, we find out a way that, that, I mean, I mean, that should be communication and finding it, taking the discussion further and finding out what the other person wants and. And then he says that doesn't work because it's reason and, and negotiation is more about emotions, not reason. He said, or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think feel like what he was saying was that the, con- the common view of win-win actually turns out to be a uh, compromise for both people, even though we mm-hmm. call it win-win. Yeah. Right. So it's lose-lose I, lose, that, actually, right? Right. Well, let's nobody say you're trying to. Me, right? Yeah. So if you're, let's say you're married, right, and you're using these these <laughs> this information in this book to try to work out negotiations, are you really like? It, how can you always never split the difference? I mean, I feel like maybe he's just being pr- provocative in that title, but you can't you can't really live your life never splitting a difference. I mean, really, can you? I mean, would that make for a happy relationship with anybody? Like, we're always going to get ice cream when I want to, and there's never any other option. Seems not that nice if we're just talking about relationships like that. Yeah. Well, I mean... What I understood... I mean, I know Good. we're not talking about ice cream. We're talking about hostage negotiation, but uh, but in just regular yeah, life, about, I mean. Yeah, I think it more. It, I've I've been watching. I don't know if you remember that or still going on the the blacklist on Netflix. Mm-hmm. 
So the, the conversations or the stories he's been telling keeps reminding me of the way that um, James Spader um, does his, his negotiations. Um, so yeah, I think it, everything is, can, you can apply it in real life. I don't know. So when, when I mean, the win, there's win, 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 lose, lose, win, and then lose, lose. So he's saying like everything win, win is, there's a loss in it. So I think what he's saying, like, either I get the full cake and convince the other party that they're, that they got what they need. And I, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what I understood that he's, he's using psychology to let, to, to control the opponent that this is what they need and you're getting it, whatever I say it is. So, so uh, if Catherine's saying, uh, whenever I want ice cream, everyone is coming with me, let's say, um, I make them feel like they need ice cream every time I, I need ice cream. <laughs> that's, that's how I understood. She all has right. to ask why her person doesn't want ice cream every, all the time and figure out why they don't want it. <laughs> but then try to convince them they do want it. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Well, one, well Oh, sorry. I, no, I was going to say one thing I loved about the book was the part where he says you should say no three times or five times without actually saying the word no. Mm -hmm. I was saying that's very generous of you, but it's so embarrassing. I don't have that much money. So that yeah. you're getting them to feel like they don't really want to embarrass you, right? So it's a good one. I'm going to try that next time. Yeah. Uh, can can you say that again, Wendy? Can you say the, the ice cream example? What do you think? Well, so she, if she's trying to have ice cream all the time, then she has to figure out why her counterpart doesn't want ice cream all the time <laughs> so that then they can negotiate. That's the first step, right? Trying to figure right, out, right. That's trying to figure out where they're but coming from. Eventually, yeah. they have to get it every day. That's what I, that's <laughs> what eventually, what I, what eventually yeah, because we're, we're never eventually. getting the difference. We're never that's saying, right. like, we'll get it today, but not tomorrow, because that's instead. I just read that book. Never split. The ice cream's a stupid example, I'll just say. Okay, let's. I, I tried one of the techniques. Yeah, no it was, uh, my husband came in from his office at the house to have some lunch, and I was just finishing up and I was reading the book. And I said, It seems like you're feeling tired. <laughs> and what did he say? I wasn't trying to negotiate anything, I just was trying one of the things. You just labeled him. He said, Yeah. yeah. He, he said, said yes. label. Yeah, he said, try it he on your yes. ten year um, I know, on your I child. I'm tired. Male <laughs> person. <laughs> yeah. He's just practicing. Elizabeth <laughs> makes a good point. She says um, that he, that he, Chris Voss, goes over how to pre-think how much you're going to give up on your split. And of course, the the never split the difference. Sure, that may be somewhat provocative because in hostage negotiation. You, you can't. I think the example he says is, well, um, give us back two hostages and you keep two hostages, right? That doesn't, doesn't right. work. Not so, um, but, but Elizabeth is right. He, he does talk about having the plan, you know, pre-planning, um, what, oh, there was a, there was a great phrase, uh, assumptions, assumptions kill or something, but, but you have to, you have to, think through different scenarios as you pre-plan. You have to think through the different scenarios, but don't assume anything. So you're always testing those, those, uh, those theories. Um, and there are lots of responses to ice cream over here. Uh, Chris <laughs> yeah. says, Important. it seems to me like yeah. you're hungry and looking for a snack. Yep. And uh, John Jones says, or you could just open the freezer and scoop out all the ice cream you want. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So, That's true. <laughs> for the for the ice cream, Christian says he's glad that his uh, his wife hasn't read the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> if any of your spouses are around, you may not want them to listen to this conversation and know what you're trying to do here. <laughs> yeah, well, I just use it on. I just I just use it on my husband also. <clears throat> he might be able to hear me. But um... when I when I got the book, I read the first couple of pages. I was like. Mm -mm, I can't do this. I gave it to my husband. I, think, I thought I said I thought you <laughs> you can benefit from this book more than I can, and he was like, mm, "This is really good book, but I don't have time for it." 
<laughs> so is he is he using it on you now? No, she doesn't know. But he he's he so good at it. it. She doesn't. He, he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it avoids it avoids escalating fights that's for sure if you try to at least look like you're trying to understand what the person is saying then if you say it looks like you don't want to do x y or z or you're feeling sad that, no that's not it that's not what i meant you know so i just think it helps like wendy was saying it's not really tricking anybody it's just trying to pay attention to them and well, hear and them i think to what to wendy's point earlier you know with the relative that likes to likes to be right, I guess is, I think is how you, uh, how you described it. And there's, I've got some of those. Um, when Chris Voss is talking about negotiation, uh, I don't remember exactly how he put it, but it was negotiation is communication with an outcome or something like that. And so it's not about arguing, right? It's about getting, getting to some sort of outcome, getting to some sort of agreement, which, you know, when you're dealing with people that, um, always want to be right, that's, that's really hard, but what's, what's the outcome that we're after? I think that's important, right? It's, there's, there's a goal in mind, whatever mm. that is. But those people who always want to be right, cause to be honest, I would like to always be right. Um, <laughs> But, but I feel you? like I'm okay with being wrong sometimes and being wrong is okay. But the person who always wants to be right, they probably, if you try to understand them, they're probably afraid of looking foolish or afraid of not getting what they want in whatever way or, well, you know. Well, so here's so, an in interesting story about that. Um, this same person, the same relative, about 25 to 30 years ago, I had, I knew I was about to be in a, a tricky conversation with them. And... I said to myself, how am I going to get through this? Now, granted, I'm not even sure this book was written, but I said, I need to totally immerse myself in what that person is thinking so that I can, this person needs to, to be able to feel safe talking to me and that I'm not going to be attacking them and that I'm not going to be accusing them or, you know, they need to be in a safe place so that we can have a normal conversation. And this other friend of mine was, she, she was not looking forward. She was worried for me. And, um, it went, we had about a 20, 20 minute discussion and it was amazing and very successful and so weird. I mean, I was, I was deep in the, in the empathy there. In fact, so for me, I, I'm thinking, you know, I'm reading the book and tactical empathy to, for me, it's just empathy because of the way I grew up and just my background. Um, as a, as a oldest of a single parent, I feel like I, you know, already had extra empathy. So, um, John Jones was asking about a, a, a success story and it's not as a result of the book, but I could, I felt myself going back to that moment where I knew I had to have a difficult conversation and the, the best preparation I could do was get into that person's point of view and, help them feel safe. So I was seeing I, that in the book. I was, I was, I was yeah. like, Oh yeah, that's what happened during that time. You know, I think that's a really great way to put it. That, that safe space, um, because that, that is at the heart of it, right? We, if we're going to argue, right, this isn't, this isn't going anywhere, but if we're going to have that place and you know, the mirroring and the labeling and all those, all those techniques that he explains are, are kind of setting that up. Maria says that she understood that it's not necessarily convincing, but allowing the other person to convince themselves that what they are asking for is not needed or excessive. And I, I think that is actually a good summary of, uh, of what the, uh, of what he's talking about. There's another one. Mark says one of the, one of Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people is quote, seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's a similar idea to tactical empathy. Oh, and that's I, interesting. I wonder if that's where the book, that's where it came from. I did read that book a long time ago. Yeah. That helped well, me. Yeah, and I think that relates yes. to what you're, exactly what book. you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Also, it's um, yeah. similar. I think similar there's stuff. a lot of. Oh, sorry, Ezra, go ahead. Go ahead, Catherine. I, I was just going to say, it's I also in that book, um, 
No, I don't think so because it was in that book, uh, How to Make Friends and Influence People, too, I think. Yes, Del Carnegie. That's what I, what I was going to say. You were going to say And I, I yeah. think uh, that book resonates. Yes, I knew. I knew you were going to say that because you recommended that book to me. And I, I probably listen, read it and listened to it like three times. Uh, I, I, feel, I feel that um, How to Win Friends and Influence People resonates with me more than... I, uh, more than never split the difference. Hmm. I don't. I, I think maybe it's that the needs same to be a future book club probably, book. Probably the same. That would be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't read that. Yeah, take I have but Catherine did recommend that. Make sure that you book. say. Yeah. It's a great book. Like, make sure you say everyone's name. Or you keep saying that person's name. Hmm. Right. Yeah. To win friends and influence people. But, I feel like if you follow. Yeah, yeah, it's but like, hi Lee, hi Jeff, hi Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I felt I, really I, good I and friendly to toward you when you used my name just that hot. So you felt it, you know? yeah. but it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's seen. Maybe it does. No, I don't know. I I agree because I think he uses more. Um, I mean, we don't have to talk about that book, but in that book, he's more on everyday experiences where most of us haven't negotiated for hostages or. The, one of the just really striking scenes in the book was when he was talking about how they did not, they were not play, paying close enough attention to this hostage and what he was actually saying. And what he they realized later after he just, I won't even repeat it, but violently killed this woman was that he wanted to be dead. He was hoping that they were going to shoot him and they hadn't even read his whole note. And so they didn't realize that he wasn't interested in getting anything except for dead you know so he's willing to kill people which they didn't realize but anyway so the mistake there being that they didn't really pay close attention to what they wanted maybe that's where my memory of some version of assumption kills came mm. from because they they assumed that they knew and they weren't yeah. right, like you said, nobody were had ever killed a hostage on a deadline before yeah yeah Scott says uh, he's getting his mom and dad's house ready to put on the market. And uh, this book is proving itself invaluable in his negotiations, primarily with his perfectionist father. So glad we could help with that, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Rod says the book makes a good point that the person across the table from you is not the adversary, but the situation is the adversary and you are actually a partner mm -hmm with a person across the table to reach a solution. I think that's a really good point. And that gets to that um, um, communication with an outcome. You know, there's, we're going to get to this together. There's, there's a solution that we're after, not just, uh, you know, butting heads or cutting hostages in half or however you split the difference. <laughs> Seems well, very I quit from the blacklist. Yes. I watched, I watched yesterday, he was telling his, I don't know if it, she's, I don't know, I don't want to burn the movie at that show, but he was telling his, probably mentee, um, there are no sides, only players. And that, that word was pretty powerful and made a lot of sense um, with Chris Foss's um, book. Now I'm going to watch The Blacklist in a whole new light. I, I, I it is I'm obsessed, like and I don't watch TV <laughs> that much. But <laughs> that's the only show I record. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it Mark says it's interesting that the panel loves Carnegie and Covey's take, but is resisting Voss. Uh, same idea coming from different perspectives. It's not about hostages. It's yes. about finding a solution that works for everyone. It's not about everyone getting what they want. Yeah. No, I get that. And I am obsessed with Chris Voss, yeah. as we re revealed today on Clubhouse. I'm not really obsessed with him. I'm just mesmerized by him. So <laughs> I I'm not against Chris Voss. I just think that the different takes kind of seem more accessible to our own lives because we're not because right, of the hostage thing. And there is a very interesting book, though, in that way. And just imagining your life being trying to get people's loved ones back to them. Just, geez, you think we have a stressful job. Well, you know what I would recommend, and this is obviously beyond the book, but, um, and, and I don't, I've said this a few times probably this week, I'm doing my best this year to channel Chris Voss. That's I know you keep saying I'm, that, but how, can you give me like five examples of how you do that besides your voice? Five examples? <laughs> the late five night DJ examples voice? Besides your voice. 
Well, Catherine, yeah. here's how it goes. <laughs> okay, for example, because that's one example. <laughs> well, in any time something comes up, you know, it's with a client or a prospective client, or I, I don't know that I have used it much around the house, so to speak. But but basically, any any time I have to come to some agreement or work something out with anybody, I I am literally going, okay, what would Chris Foss do? How would he handle the solution? Mm-hmm. So we we bought our daughter a uh, we have a new newish now driver in the house, and so we went out and bought her a used car. Okay, how would Chris Voss negotiate for this used car, which in my mind is one of the worst experiences on earth? Um, you know how when I'm uh, recently when I was negotiating, so to speak, or getting ready to pitch a uh, fee for a uh, uh, a new client. Okay. How would Chris Voss go into, go into this situation, you know, this, this fee negotiation, if there was going to be any, so it's, it's just that, I mean, it's all situational. Right. But what do you actually say to the person with the fee situation? What do I actually say? I mean, it depends on the situation, right? It's, it's all, it all depends on the the person in the situation, what everybody's after. Um, but what I was going to say about, you know, beyond the book is there's lots of videos out there. He's got lots of videos, lots of great videos on his website. So when I'm going into that situation, if I need to refresh my my memory, I'll Google or I'll go to his website or something. I'll look up a video and watch a few minutes of a video. And, you know, as Elizabeth was saying earlier, I'll put my game plan together and, and try to work out all the scenarios. Like Chris Voss would, not mm-hmm. like Jeff Chris would. Chris Novelli <laughs> is saying Catherine is using Voss's technique. She's, she's getting Jeff. Jeff to talk. <laughs> That's exactly what she's doing. Well. Because <laughs> I read the book. Who was it? She did. Um, yeah. At two times speed. What? Um, 1.8, actually. <laughs> okay. Somebody earlier asked for examples. I don't remember who it was, but but John Jones says the um, – no, it wasn't you. It was someone in the comments. John Jones says one of his best friends worked with Chris Voss to rescue his brother. That, oh, yeah. That was actually in the book, I wasn't it? I think that it? was in the book, yeah. Wasn't yeah. it? I think, I think that's one of the – it was in the Philippines, wasn't it? Which one was that where the guy, like the brother just talked to without asking for any reciprocity? Was that the example? Or he just wants to know, like, how do I know he's still alive or something? Was that the one? I don't remember. I remember like, the brother and I remember the guy? Philippines. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's pretty big. That's so yeah. the, so wait, that means that you know Chris Voss. We have two two um degrees of separation from Chris Voss, so you could maybe set up in a um, Kevin Bacon sort of way. Yeah. Maybe maybe we will get him on the show after all. There, yeah. there was an offer to have one of his associates join us for the show. And mm-hmm. that one kind of, the communication has, has died on that. So I don't know. Maybe we could, maybe we could try to negotiate for Chris Voss to be on our show. <laughs> <laughs> That's another I way. I probably would appreciate that. That's right. We've got at least six I of think us. Catherine right? <laughs> Catherine no, has I, proved that. I'm, I'm sure I'll say something good. ridiculous about cheese to Chris Voss because he, I, I would just be, don't know what to say to him. Cheese is a good subject because cheese is great, but it's embarrassing to talk to Chris Voss about cheese. Especially when it's grated. <laughs> yeah, I guess grated cheese is good. Are you trying to say you want ice cream and cheese all the time? Yeah. No, I just say <laughs> stupid things. Well, like when I... Yeah, I just embarrass myself with the things I say. Yeah. I'm sure you can't imagine how that could possibly be true. But yeah, one time I said that to Moshe Softy, something about cheese, and then I thought, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> so did he, probably. But anyway, yeah, so we should try to negotiate to him, uh, to having him. Uh, I don't know Chris Voss, but you know your friend. The brother. Maybe that's three. No, it's two. I think it's an opening. That's all I'm saying. I think it's a way we could get him on. Also, he's on Clubhouse a lot. Have you ever heard Chris Voss on Clubhouse? Mm-hmm. He, um, 
I wonder if he uh, I, followed me I back. Th- I followed him. Let me just check. Oh, I'm sure he's. Start. I'm sure he's. Sure, he followed you. me back. Yeah. Oh, I hope he followed you back, Catherine. Oof, I know. Gosh, that would be exciting. Uh, Manuel says I was also reading Twelve and a Half by Gary Vaynerchuk, and Never Split the Difference seems like a strange companion to it until one realizes that Twelve and a Half seems to be about having empathy, and particularly interesting to me about accountability which you need to have in a hostage situation. Um, yeah, I had not, I had not put two and two together. We were, I think we were just talking about that earlier today, that, that book by Gary Vaynerchuk, if there are any, it's a good book. I would recommend it as well. But if you, um, and if you're familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk, 12 and a half may surprise you a little bit. It's all about emotional intelligence. We should have him on the show too. Working on it. That would be exciting. <laughs> but if, if Spanky's been working on it for a few years, we it may take us a while. I know I already mentioned maybe he doesn't like Spanky. Maybe that's, that's why he hasn't been on Spanky's show. <laughs> maybe. That wasn't nice to Spanky. Spanky seems like a really great guy. Yep. I'm just saying doesn't mean we shouldn't try to get him on the and, show. And he looks like Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, Elizabeth says her biggest takeaway was to eliminate why questions. Yeah. They do that was always a good point. cause a fight. Yeah, they do always cause a fight. So how do you how do you rephrase that? Anybody want to do a role playing thing with Jeff? <laughs> you could be the why asker, and Jeff will re- rephrase it. Just making up a new <laughs> no, game. That was, that was the opposite of what we were going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to demonstrate it, and the other person was going to say you were going to say something, and then they were going to say, "Why would you do that?" Well, I appreciate is- your confidence in me, Catherine. Well, you're always channeling Chris <laughs> Moss, right? So you should be able to. I, mean, I was, I was wondering. <laughs> Someone else would. Rod says another point is about finding what the other side needs. His example of buying a car and staying on a price doesn't mention that the salesman or dealer have their agenda too. They may receive an amount from the manufacturer per sale, regardless of the profit. The salesman may have made his quota and doesn't really need a sale and would rather do the crossword. Hang on, it scrolled. And would rather do the the uh, crossword puzzle in the office. He may need the sale, so he'll do anything to get it. Car dealers make their money on service and financing more than selling a car. Yeah, that's, I guess I never thought about that, but it, um, um, their motivations may change from, sale to, or what they need, I guess, may change from sale to sale as they go through the month. Has anybody ever used, uh, taken, never split the difference into a car dealership? No, but I'm going to. No, not yet. Well, <laughs> there'll be a few years. I'm not in the market right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to get a I've Polestar it, pretty soon. You've used it on a car? In practice. No, yeah. no, in actual practice. Um, it worked. Um, someone wasn't right. paying on time and I was like, well, how am I going to, how can I keep working on your project? If you're not paying on time, solve things really quick. Yeah. Yeah. The real simple thing, uh, that's a real thing. If you just ask the question, well, how am I supposed to do that? It seems to work really well. Yeah. What? I tried that. Did it work? And did it work for you, Isra? Yes. It did. Yes. Okay. How am I going to do that? I feel like I would need to come up I, with I, a I was, different way to say it. Like, how am I supposed to do that? It isn't something that I would say in a normal situation. So I have to rephrase, which is, he did say, you have to rephrase a lot and ask this, you know, say the same thing in a different way. Sorry, I wasn't so. trying to well, show that. Well, natural just now, Wendy. So, like, I, I did. <laughs> no, I'll have to try it then. Yeah. I recently said to someone who hadn't paid me for a couple months, it seems like you're having difficulty paying. So I'm happy to talk about a way maybe we could work out some other payment schedule. And she said, oh, no, it's not that. I just forgot. And then she paid me. Oh, huh, there you go. But it did seem like she was having trouble paying because she wasn't doing it. So that was the only assumption I could make. Cool. Well, I mean, it's, well, it's I good you labeled her, right? About. Yeah. You labeled it. That's right. 
But it's like trying a label. That's a lot what he talks about. It's like you're not determinate. It's like it seems like, sounds like it could be wrong, but right. he gives him an out. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's a that's a good point too because it's you know if if you if you say something more assertive, and I don't know what that would be. It's like hey, you're you're not paying me. That's pretty obvious, or you know you're way behind. Then, then that presents a point of conflict. But if you flip it away, the flip it around the way that you did, now you're actually opening up a conversation, and I guess then in theory working together towards Mm -hmm. towards some sort of solution. It's it is amazing how I I guess everything in there is is and it makes sense, right? He's negotiating for hostages, but it's all about de escalating. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, re- removing conflict in the most conflict-ridden situations, I guess. Yeah, like that part when he was get, almost going to get in a fight with that veteran in the bar, but he said, hey, my name's Chris. Like the guy got in his face and he's like, hey, I'm Chris. Uh, and then I don't remember what he said next, but just personalizing it by giving your name or saying, what's the Chris discount? Which I assume we're supposed to say our own name, not what's the Chris discount. <laughs> you should try the, <laughs> What's the Chris discount? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, but your name ain't Chris. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> yep. getting it. But that also shows confidence, right? It also shows like he's in control. He's confident. I, I mm-hmm. can't, can't imagine myself. And then he's friendly yeah. too. So this it's is, not like he has to be is... <laughs> adversarial, you know? He's friendly, yes. Yeah. I'm gonna have to watch some videos. I don't know anything about what what he looks like or anything, but or t- you know, talks like I was mentioned in Clubhouse this morning. It was kind of comical because I borrowed the book digitally from the library, and then as a backup, because I had to wait for it. As a backup, I also borrowed the audio because I wasn't sure which one was going to be available first, and I wanted to finish before today. And so I read the digital one almost all the way through and then it expired and they took it back. And so I read the last day I had the the audio available, but it's not read by Chris Voss. Mm -hmm. It's read by someone else. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like kind of dull actually. (laughs) And I was like thinking to myself, well, I guess that the voice in my head was a lot more interesting or animated or something. (laughs) And, And apologies to, uh, Michael Kramer, but I just don't think his heart was in it. Yeah. <laughs> his heart wasn't in it. I, I think you should read it. that again, Michael. Really feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Read the whole thing. Yeah. Um, hey, you know, we only have five minutes left and people are asking what the book is, Jeff. They're going to have to hang on. <laughs> There's okay. so. Hang on. <laughs> I, I understand that you want to know. <laughs> It seems like it you're seems impatient like a lot to of find people out. want to know what the next book yeah. is. Yeah, and we're going to tell you in a, in a few minutes. Um, it's understandable. Speaking, <laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> the there's a video out there, and it and I like. I think I've seen a couple of different versions of it, mainly of him speaking at an event, and I don't remember who you know who the audience is, but they're great applications of what he's talking about for professionals. And the one that sticks out in my mind is a situation where someone has come to you and, um, you know, maybe they've talked to other architects. There are certainly other architects out there, of course. Um, and he, he uses, he uses this way, and I don't remember if, if it's an anchoring technique. I don't remember how he described it, but basically, you're asking you're asking the people why they came to you. you know, well, mm-hmm. why did you call me? A pretty innocent question, right? And then they they talk about it, they tell you, and then you turn around and use that back on them, right? And I, but I think that's a really important lesson for everybody you know, that provides professional services, design services, et cetera, is they came to you for a reason. They're telling you what the, what they value about you. And so you need to use that in your 
proposal, you know, how, however you're getting to, to a number with them. And I, I think that's a really practical uh, application for, for this audience is um, y- using that kind of technique. And I don't remember what, what it would be called in the book, but um, there are a couple of videos at least out there about that. Now we're getting getting cat comments, which is great. <laughs> the middle the middle row is the is the cat row. Catherine, where's your cats? I don't know. I started looking around for a cat because one crawled up on Hans, and then and then one crawled up on Wendy. Mom, mom came up. She's hard to see because she's black, so she did blend. No, she, that means there's a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He's probably hanging out in the Joyce Bay somewhere. He likes to. <laughs> Be up in the electrical in the wires. I thought this was a was a raccoon at first, and I was I was going to yell, "Look out!" Huh? <laughs> a raccoon. <laughs> it's a, it's a raccoon. I thought you were lap. a big nature guy, Jay. That doesn't look that much like a raccoon. Yeah, they can crawl on your lap when you, there's something wrong. With <laughs> That's definitely, definitely. I, I would think. All right, so. Elizabeth yeah. wants to know if Hans's cat is a superhero. I don't know. Uh, Maybe. Well, I think so. Uh, <laughs> she has a, a rank instead of a name. She, her, name her name's Lieutenant. So oh. she's quite a fierce kitty. All right. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I'm going to move her away. She has a really loud burn. It would sort of drown out my voice. So I'm going to go back to being muted. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my gray cat will come back. Come to. I have two a black and a gray. So. That's going to become a prerequisite for anybody that wants to be on the screen for book club is that they have an animal with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. I, I know we are, uh, I know we're almost at the top of the hour. Rod says the master class is much, much more involved mm-hmm. than the audio book. Yeah. That the master class, I've heard great things about it. It's definitely on my bucket list. So when I have more, uh, time i'm going to do the master class certainly oh you have Uh, to because like the way he's so smooth he just sits there and he's just like not really that concerned with the outcome seemingly yeah Yeah. i don't care if you kill those hostages Hmm. hey Hey, i'm chris (laughs) in the late night (laughs) dj voice (laughs) oh fm fm dj voice (laughs) i guess the am djs were were high-pitched scratchy yeah they were Yeah. yeah All right, we're 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 at the top of the hour. Um, before we lose everybody here, um, two two things. Next week on Context and Clarity Live, our uh, guest will be Pascal Sablon. I looked this up. I I've got my facts straight now. Uh, Pascal Sablon will be our guest for Context and Clarity Live next week. She is the president elect of Noma. National Organization of Minority Architects. She is a senior associate at Adjay Associates Architects. So, uh, David Adjay. She is the creator of the Say It Loud expeditions. You'll have to Google those. And the founder and executive director of Beyond the Built Environment. She is a very interesting uh, person. Um, very accomplished at a relatively young age, seeing that as a, as a fairly old guy. Um, this is going to be a, a really interesting conversation next week. And so, as always, I will post tomorrow morning about, uh, about uh, Pascal. I'll give you, in the comments, I'll give you a little bit of background that you can click on and, and check her out. And then let me know what you want to talk about next week. So that's our Saturday morning tradition. Uh, so I'll keep that up tomorrow. Now, um, next month you've got, so you've got a three day, three and a half day, I guess, head start next yeah. month, the book that we will read and, uh, and then discuss, let me click on the calendar here real quick, discuss on Friday, March 25th. So the final Friday in the month is March it's really 25th. only four weeks. So it's not much of an advance. Those. It's not much of an advance, right? So mm-hmm. you've got You've got your work cut out for you. You've got just over four weeks to read this. Um, Dare to Lead by Brene Yay, Brown. Yay, I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> so Dare to Lead by Brene Brown will be our March 
Context and Clarity Book Club book. Um, put in, this is going to be hard, but yeah, we'll, we'll do it anyway. Um, wherever you are right now, if you would like to, first of all, if you are committed to reading the book, type dare in the comments right now. And mm-hmm. then if you would like to be on the screen next month, Friday, March 25th type book club in the comments. So dare, if you're going to read it and (laughs) these two actually need to align dare, if you're going to read it and book club, if you want to be on screen next month, I think we should have my dare to be in the book club because they're saying both. Okay. Dare to be in the book club. If you want to be on screen. (laughs) So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm kind of surprised. I'm just going to say that I'm kind of surprised at how, how, no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> You're about to bring some mom vibes there. <laughs> I yep. think I know where that was going. Yeah. Look, I'm just embracing my mom. Yeah, I was going to bring some mom vibes into that. <laughs> I'm disappointed. I want to know what you're going to say because I don't know. Yeah, well, I was, <laughs> you don't know, Jay. Um, I was just going to say that I'm, I'm, no, I'm not going to say it, but I'm just a kind of surprised that people don't end up reading the book. That's it. I said it. It's, it, it, you know, I'm going to go back. Oh, obviously, all it. of you did read I'm it. sorry. So I, I, and you are sorry. You made me tell you that, Jay. But I mean, I feel like I think these are really exciting. So um, I just am looking forward to uh, discussing them with everybody. So, so maybe, that's why I get disappointed. Right. Maybe we need to find out why our counterparts aren't reading the book. I think they don't have time. Uh, right. You know, that's I, so yeah, we should ask them. Yeah. You I'm, could ask I'm, them so now. I'm going to say assumptions. If mm-hmm. you, if, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> Wendy is channeling Chris Falls she, right now. Yes. She is. I, I'm going to go to and anyone can what, feel free to answer. <clears throat> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go to what George said yesterday. Um, talking about time. He said, you have time. You just have to make time or prioritize or whatever he said. And I'm going to go back to what I said at the very beginning. I set a goal in 2019. That's why I wanted to do this book club. I set a goal in 2019 to read 12 books because I hadn't read anything, you know, like periodicals and articles and listen to podcasts and things like that. But I, I had not read a book maybe since college, literally. And that was what? a long time Are ago. Are you kidding? I hadn't read a book no, since co- college. I hadn't, I hadn't read a book Ooh. in a long time and I didn't read too many books no in college, book? to be honest. Yeah. Um, you haven't read any kind of book, not even so, like novels. No. No. So <laughs> I set that goal. And like I said, by the end of the year, I, I basically went, okay, reading, reading this book is good. I'm actually enjoying this. I'm learning things. And by the end of the year, and, and again, I don't read books. I listen to books. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the end of the year, I was up to, I think I was on my 30th and it's the best thing I ever did. So whatever, whatever, it's I'm time, it's whatever, yeah. whatever the, the reason is, I would say find a reason to read the books because these are, um, these are good books. Mm-hmm. They're important books. they are books that will help you in your business that could help you in your life oh. and, I think you'll find that if you read them, that um, Hans, Hans is type dare, um, that you're actually going to benefit quite a bit from them. So that's my plea, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason I'm surprised, Jeff, is not because I was judging you for not reading, but because I considered you be like the Mr. Book guy because you're always talking about books. Well, so remember. I'm just surprised. <laughs> that was just new, the new Jeff. The new 2020 uh, Jeff Eccles, which is when well, I met you. Like, it was like 30 in 2019, and that's three years ago, right? Right. So it's a lot of books between now and then. Yeah. Yep. That's well, my new uh, my new uh, TikTok effort is going to be talking about books. I don't know. I don't think it, I don't know about that one. <laughs> But anyway, good. I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about books on TikTok. Wait and see. Okay. And also, I didn't mean to say that I, I just really enjoyed talking to all of you about the book 
today and the people in the comments. Catherine wants so you to read books. Read the book so we can play the game, which is talking about the book. Yeah, Jeff, I had a, a time period where I didn't read books for a while, which I really did. Turns out I really missed. Um, and then my kids, I would wait for them at the bus stop. They're in their 20s now, but when I'd wait for them at the bus stop, I decided to read. And that got me back in, even I was just yeah. reading five, 10 yeah. minutes at a time. But um, mm. I realized how much I missed it. And Yeah, I mean, so... Catherine, you asked not any kind of books. Yeah, I, I read like kids' books to kids. There you go. Those are books. Um, but to your point, Wendy, I replaced it with podcasts. Hmm. And so I was consuming, you know, I was consuming other things, but not reading books. And so it was just, it was that conscious effort to actually get back to a volume, you know, an actual work. Um, and that's that's why the goal and, um, and, and for me, I was traveling a lot at that point. So I was on an airplane or in a car and you can, you can listen all the time when and you, take notes. When, and, when you hear the book again, do you remember where you were? Like, do you remember that you were standing at the gate last time you heard that? Book? Oh yeah. 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 yeah those, those associations are pretty strong. Yeah. Happens yeah. to me with, um, projects, which I know I've mentioned before, but when I, if I'm listening to a book while I'm drafting or designing a project, mm -hmm. then when I present the project, I think of that book. There's, there's a lot of research on multi-sensory, what do they call it? Like multi-sensory memory. Mm. So if you're like, if you're studying for something, how many different senses can you involve, can you involve at the same time? Mm. Because that, that's just multiple triggers. Oh, that's a good that idea. Mm -hmm. Can you I, exercise and do it at the same time? I just looked and I read 30 books last year. Um, but How'd you on, find that out, Jay? On Audible. Um, okay. And something I read in the last day or two was talking about this. You know, some people say that they zone out when they're listening. And, and what the research is saying, it doesn't matter. You'll mm -hmm. still take in a good amount of that information. Really? Wow. The little guys in the back room. That's, that's, I, I find that maybe reassuring, but, but when I start to zone out, I turn it off because I'm worried. I, I, I listen to it very actively. I, on audible, I use the, um, it looks like a bookmark, but it's called something else, but basically where you can bookmark it. Um, and then I take notes too, while I'm listening, which can get, interesting when you're driving I, listen, so I don't usually take notes but i do i will give my it gives siri a note while i'm while i'm driving mm -hmm. um, oh, lucky you your siri pays attention is helpful <laughs> you know what i read it back later and i'm like siri that's not what i said i some of those aren't even words siri why are you <laughs> The things that aren't yeah, like, why would I say that, Siri? See, that's an example of why is just contentious and you're going to get in a fight with Siri if you say that. And then she <laughs> then she really won't do what you say. So what could we say to Siri instead of why would you think I would say that, Siri? You could say, seems like you think I'm talking about. <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Jay Rod wants to know if you can repeat that. He zoned out. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Rod. You got it. <laughs> And Rod has listened to 16 books this year. That's a that's a good pace. Eight so books for, a month. Can I make a recommendation for people who can only read books to kids who are in a phase of their lives where the only books they read are the ones mm. they read to their children? So my favorite thing to read to my kids was the Chronicles of Narnia, which they had to be a little bit older. I mean, a baby wouldn't probably care. But a baby could listen to it and never split the difference, too. So that's a good thing about babies. But um, yeah, so Chronicles of Narnia. That's just fun to read. So if you have like a seven to 12 year old and you read to them still, yeah, which don't, those are don't fun. Don't read them a Gary Vee book. I used to change words and things in books if I didn't like, like uh, it. Yeah. So you could also do that if you wanted to read them a Gary Vee book. Yeah. Nicole is an audio book person and her goal is 52 books this year, which she usually hits. That's awesome. Hmm. Yeah, that is good. The thing That's is, all of us want to write books, right? So people are out there writing books all the time on really interesting things. And we can mm. participate. Well, one thing I started 
and again, I hadn't, I hadn't read books, uh, uh, you know, like <laughs> adult oriented books for a long time. And I started listening to these books and I would listen to one on this topic and one on, you know, a different topic. And all of a sudden I would, there would be correlations between this one and that one. So like we talked earlier about Dale Carnegie and, and, uh, Chris Voss and, uh, Blair Inns and I'm leaving somebody out. We talked about four different books. Stephen Covey. Covey. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stephen Covey. And so I would start noticing those things, you know, sort of these, I'm visualizing them as sort of these intersections in a network and go, there's something about that. I, I started calling them truths is, is those intersections were truths. It's showing up in all these different places mm -hmm. from all these different authors and on different subjects. There's something about that, that intersection there. And that's, that's what really yeah. started to interest me about, um, about reading so or listening to so much was where, where are these things intersecting? And so I really appreciate the, the four coming together um, today. That's the way I look at world religions. They all have something that they intersect on, which seems to be a truth, you know? So mm -hmm. empathy. I was going to say love, but <clears throat> Uh, that's included, I guess. Empathy's included with that. Yeah. What's well, five thirteen, Jeff? I mean, this book it club is. is so much fun. I mean, we don't notice it's it's five fifteen on this a Friday. Is, this afternoon. is when you break the drinks out, right? And then you really <laughs> start talking about the book. <laughs> <laughs> then you do. Yeah. Jay brought his out. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for this conversation today. Thanks for reading the book for those of you that did, and uh, if you didn't, still. Read never split the difference. Um, we read by the end of this weekend. You said, which was a strange, sp strangely specific directive you had earlier. All right. By the end of today, read <laughs> never split the difference. That's so they can read the next one on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Or yeah, the next one. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to read the next one. Just for you know. Yeah. It'll, uh, it'll be a good one. So remember, you know, you've got to read Never Split the Difference. I guess technically uh, March doesn't start until Tuesday, so you get even more reprieve. But, you know, by the end of the day would be good. Um, read Never Split the Difference. And then read um, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. We will discuss it on Friday, March 25th in the March edition of our Context and Clarity Book Club. So to Wendy and Hans and Jay and Isra and Catherine, thanks for joining me here on screen for this conversation today. And for all of you out there on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and wherever you are, uh, I saw Kurt came in a few minutes ago, so I'm sure he was over on Twitch. Um, thank you to all of you for this conversation and thanks for uh continuing to make context and clarity of things so we can do things like the book club. Um, I think it's, uh, it's still a great community that's, that's growing around this and um, adding in these, these special things means a lot. So thanks to all of you. Have a great weekend, great day, a great afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And um, please take care of yourselves. Be well, be safe. There's, it's getting crazier and crazier. So keep those around you safe and well and uh, find some time to breathe and relax in a way to rejuvenate. And because um, we're going to do this all over again next week. Remember, tomorrow morning, I will post in the Facebook group about Pascal Sablon, who will be our guest next week for Context and Clarity Live. Let me know what you want to talk about next week. and We'll get uh, next week planned out. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate you and hope that I'll see you somewhere sometime soon. <laughs>